what is the name of the podcast? Oh, this is the your Research podcast. Hour? We search. <laughs> I'm disappointed in everything right now. <laughs> Welcome to the Research Hour, aka We Search. I'm Silas. <laughs> and I'm Joshua. We are going to be taking a look at some of those little facts that you hear in your everyday life that aren't important enough for you to really be worried about them, so you never bother to look them up. And we are going to do that extremely difficult work of looking them up. But we also are not going to spend that much time doing it. No. So we might be wrong. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because we tried and the information just doesn't matter very much. So today, I am going to be researching whether or not it's true that 60% of car crashes happen within five miles of someone's home. And Josh... I'm going to be researching, so you always hear the story that lemmings throw themselves off of cliffs, but that's not actually true because it was a film crew that like chased them off of cliffs. So you always hear that story, and it sounds like it should be true, and if it's not true, it should be true, but I'm going to check up on that. So we are going to do the research for you. Research. I was starting to type, do 60% of, and if I just stop there, the autofill results are enough to do like 30 episodes of this podcast on one little sentence. Okay, so I just, in in my search results, nowhere near as re uh, revealing. However, apparently enough people search for do lemmings have bones <laughs> that it was the third result when I said do lemmings. Wait, now, <laughs> now it makes me wonder, wait, do they not have bones? I know, right? I mean, like, they're little rodents, so I'm pretty sure they, they have... Um, they have um they have bones, bones right like they have to have bones but like if that many people are asking the question maybe they don't have bones i mean are they just thinking of lemons lemons don't have bones <laughs> that's fair all right, all right so i'm gonna go i'm gonna start off with the all real quick before we get started i did have a thought i'm guessing this this car accidents happen within five miles of home it occurred to me that it's probably it, so, uh, in America, right, there are lots of statistics that don't apply everywhere. Like, yeah. lot, every every country has rural and urban populations. Yeah. But America has, like, incredibly dense, medium density, and then, like, lots of open space. And we have more of it than most countries. Maybe yeah. not the most, period. Like, I yeah, don't know, no, maybe no. Russia or China has a speed. But, or maybe India. But... We have, like, quite a disparity, whereas England, you know, England is, like, I don't know, the size of a state or something. The whole British Isles could fit in Pencil Pennsylvania. I almost said Peninsula. Okay, that's we have to look that up, because I don't know that's, if that's, that's a That's true. a different one that we have to look up, but I saw it in a history textbook, which means it's automatically, we know it's true. But anyways, this one occurs to me that this might be, like, one of those suburbia facts, where, like, if you live in suburbia, so a place with a lot of civilian drivers doing a lot of driving... And most of it is in like the area close to where they live. I feel like that's going to be more likely true than if you a live in New York City and like you're taking public transit. Yeah. Or B, you live in the rural outskirts of America and you got to drive five miles to get like down your driveway. Right. Exactly. So this this strikes me as one of those facts that maybe is going to be more true in some areas and very untrue in other areas. Well, and it it sounds like super ominous when you hear it, like sixty percent of accidents happen within five miles of home it just like sounds like someone's waiting to ambush you when you get close to your house but i mean in reality when you think of it like where are you usually if you're driving somewhere you're either driving to that place from home or from that place to home right so if you like actually looked at the percentage of your driving no matter where you're going you might go to a bajillion different places but it's almost like okay so yeah, maybe 60% of accidents happen within five, five miles of home, but maybe 40% of driving is within five miles of home. Right. So it's like... Percentage-wise, it's not actually as far off as it sounds. Yeah, yeah. Real quick on my, like an intro to my topic. I think there was a small period of my life where I, I knew that lemmings jumped off of cliffs, but I feel like this is the, or not new, but like thought that that was how it worked. But I feel like for most of my life, I've known this true story right, right. Like, quote unquote true story and so you wonder like how long did that let's say it you know we find out it was the scenario where the, the documentary film crew like how long did it take for that story to surface like right was it like you know this was filmed in the 70s and no one actually figured out till the 90s that it had been faked or like anyway 20 so years of tight lips i mean i feel like anyone on that crew 
is not going to admit that though. It's like, so yeah, we were out there and we were filming these guys and then we just chased them all off the cliff. It was so beautiful to see nature take its course. I assume you're doing that in reference to like the the documentary crew in one of the animated the, movies. The penguins of Madagascar. Yeah, and it's like <laughs> Werner Herzog who's doing the voiceover as the documentarian. <laughs> Anyways. Answer the real question that's been brought up by this. Do lemmings have bones? <laughs> there we go. Photo of a lemming skeleton. Science. For all you viewers at home, it looks like a skeleton. I love when people say things and then they don't link to the source. So this website... InjuryLawColorado.com. Figures provided by the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration reveal some interesting facts about car accidents. 52% within a 5 mile radius, 69% within 10 miles. Do they link to that press release or that study or anything? Nope. It's just them saying that that's what it says. And then it's like, oh, so where is the primary source on this? Uh, nowhere. This is just going to turn into a podcast where I complain about bad, about poorly written articles on other people's websites. So then they link, they say, another survey, the word survey is linked, by Progressive Insurance corroborates these numbers. So if you read that sentence and the word survey is linked, the implication is that the thing, that's the thing that is, is the linked survey, not the article, is the survey. But what it actually links to is another law company's website where they say the same, the same thing from the National Transportation Service or whatever. And then they also say a car accident survey conducted by Progressive Insurance Company, and they also link to it. And it's like the first people just linked to an article about the thing they're talking about instead of the primary source. Oh, and now the second guy just links to literally progressive.com. They don't link to the survey. They don't link to the information. They just link to a corporate website. I'm finding out that Disney killed the lemmings. <laughs> Wait, for real? So apparently... I'm, I've not read the, all of it yet, but what I've what I've picked up so far is that the behavior was staged in the Walt Disney documentary White Wilderness in 1958. So the misconception is actually older than so the idea that they commit suicide is actually older than the documentary. But the documentary that made it that it, that everyone talks about is from Disney. <laughs> wait, wait, so they went out to do the filming of the suicide and they weren't suiciding themselves? I guess so. Like I, I haven't finished reading it yet, but that's what that's what is appearing so far. So. I'm I'm interested to see where this goes. So so far we have two websites referencing the same two pieces of information which seem to corroborate the idea that 52% of accidents occur occur within a 5 mile radius and 69% within a 10 mile radius of home. But they don't link to any of the primary research. So one of the things I love about Wikipedia is how they link to other articles within Wikipedia or have like little definitions of words like the link you can just you know, scroll over it and it comes along with like a little definition. Right. They have one for mass suicide. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I feel like that one is pretty self-explanatory. Like if you know what the word suicide means, you're already most of the way there. Yes. Mass suicide is a form of suicide. <gasps> really? Occurring when a group of people simultaneously kill themselves. There we go. So I would just like to say Injury Law Colorado, a.k.a. the Babcock Law Firm, LLC. They do not understand research. Or writing, apparently. They just understand how to write an article with no authority. I thought this would be like an open and shut, like, you know, find the article referencing this video and we'd be done. But this, right. this is way more interesting. This is horrible. <sighs> okay, this is another one. But in fact, Joshua, this is the sentence. But in fact, most car accidents happen within... 25 miles of home. The words 25 miles from home are linked. Now, if you write that sentence and the words linked are 25 miles from home, do you expect it to be literally an advertisement for Allstate that just takes you to Allstate's website and tells you about the best U.S. cities to drive in? Or do you expect it to be the actual thing that the sentence is referencing? Because it's not the one that it should be. 
It's literally, it's not even a data set. It's a table, but it's literally just a table that compares like their ranking from last year, which was 2018 because this is the 2019 report. Then the average between the years, then uh, some collision data, but not like anything that was remotely related to the article which linked to it. Apparently there's a myth that lemmings can also explode. <laughs> I've got a really good documentary idea that apparently <laughs> apparently has enough of a following that someone writing a BBC article about migration, about lemming migration, decided that that was something he needed to address in the first paragraph. So he's got reputation. Norwegian. Le uh, so the reputation is that Norwegian lemmings are stupid. Like other lemmings, they show none of the cunning of other rodents. When overcrowding becomes an issue, they will run for the sea throwing themselves off cliffs for the good of the species lemmings can off can also explode it's true honest reality no no and no norwegian lemmings are not stupid they are masterful masterful burrowers like other rodents score highly when it comes to reproduction when the population becomes too dense lemmings will seek new pasture but do not commit suicide and they do not explode all right i've got the next step in this saga oh no did you finally get past your wall of circular citation? Learner and Roe. No, we have expanded. Oh, no. Learner and Roe, injury attorneys. They say approximately one third. That's the linked phrase, one third. Oh, my god. Approximately one third of all car crashes occur between one and five miles where the driver lives. Guess, guess the source of that. Progressive.com. No, no, no. This is a newspapery-like source. ABC? Guess what? It's... A UK news source. So a Las Vegas law firm is writing, basing their data on a survey that is reported by the Telegraph UK. Now, I can't actually see the survey from the Telegraph because you have to like create a, an account to have a free trial to read the rest of yeah, the yeah, article. Yeah. So the survey is something reported on in the Telegraph, which means they're at the very best, they're linking to a news sources or a news outlet's analysis of the research. Let's say the Telegraph UK has produced this article on Las Vegas driving data. It is still not a primary source. It is a it is the analysis of data by the Telegraph. Which, if I'm not mistaken, the Telegraph. Uh, well, I I won't go there. I. I feel like the Telegraph is does not the, have a good reputation in the UK. I can I could never be remember which one are the not the newspapers of repute. I'm pretty sure the Telegraph is, but I might be mixing it up. So don't quote me on that. But it doesn't matter. A law firm is still using a paywalled news outlet as their source, which is not a primary source for this. So from what I can tell... The only people talking about this are law firms who are trying to sell you law services. So this whole this whole fact supposedly has its roots in like the national the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. But the only people talking about it are people with commercial interests. So law firms or insurance companies. So now now it's it's slightly different. It's 52% within 5 miles, 77 within 15 miles. But once again, they say conducted, according to a study conducted by Progressive Insurance, at least this time they linked to the Progressive Insurance, like, news release sub-website. But when you search that website for the term car crash, two things come up that have nothing to do with the thing that they're talking about. Oh, I thought I was getting somewhere because I found an actual, uh, an actual paper on this, except I was too generous and this is just talking about injuries in general. It's not talking about traffic collisions. And so they came to the conclusion, one of the, one of the things that they talk about is like 88% of injuries happen within a 10-mile radius of home. But then they said it, it differs quite a bit depending on the age range. So very young and very old are like very likely to be injured at home. So this is just talking about... General. Injuries in general, not automotive. Uh... I just spent time reading that was like an actual report though i'm ready to call it you ready to call it yeah it's I'm been like 40 up. minutes i'm wrapping up all right you gotta go first i am going to go Who first feels, because yeah. i have nothing conclusive to say okay my conclusion is a lot of people talk about this but i can find no actual evidence that this is true 
it seems like it should be true. I like, thought this was going to be easy. I thought I was going to be spending most of my time looking into the assumption of like, hey, when we say 60% of car accidents happen within five or 10 miles of home, I was expecting it to be, oh, that's true if you live yeah, in a yeah. city with more than 500,000 people. And if you don't, then it's actually not true. I was expecting it to be like that. But like, I just, I fundamentally can't say, yes, it is true that most accidents happen close to your residence. I can tell you that a lot of people talk about that. And I can tell you that law firms who are trying to sell you accident lawyer services are really good at writing articles about that, that ultimately point to no data set other than they have just said it in their article. Other than that, I can tell you those things, but I cannot actually tell you whether or not accidents truly do happen close to home. It seems like it should be true, but I don't know. I have no real conclusion to draw from this time. I mean, I feel like, I feel like again, it's just like one of those things. It's like, yes, it is true in like the simple way that like, you know, 90% of toothbrushing takes place at home. Like, it's just right. like- You think it's true, but you can't actually say for <laughs> sure. What, what they do to get the data is just like whenever someone has a car accident, the first question the police ask them is how far away from home are you? Like, I just I could not find the data set that that yeah, you feel idea like if it was, has been derived from. It should be somewhere and it is somewhere. I couldn't find it in 30 or 40 minutes of Googling. As often as that statistic is referred to, you feel like there should be something out there. You, you feel like there should be enough studies out there or enough at least just kind of corroborations of data that, that you'd be able to find something. But that I, I'm actually really surprised that there was nothing. It should have been so easy I to figured, find. I figured it would probably, I figured like when you first started off and you were talking about it, I was like, okay, you know, he'll have to kind of get past the wall. But once he gets past the wall, it'll, it'll open up. But no luck. No luck. Okay, so lemmings. I kind of have like the opposite. So I started off thinking that I would just, you know, be one and done. I would find a corroboration that this story is true and then just, you know, kind of sit back and chill while you did real work. My conclusion is kind of yes and no. So wait, wait, wait. So the, the premise is so the lemmings premise is that, kill themselves. Okay. Well, the, the premise is that the idea that lemmings can, killed themselves came from a the documentary. documentary where it was faked. Right, where they that's killed what I've the lemmings. Heard. I've always right. heard that it, it actually originated there. Is that is that where I that's feel like where the, there was the maybe originated. six months where I heard lemmings kill themselves, and then like six months later, it was like, oh no, actually, lemmings don't kill themselves. The documentary crew faked it for because they were so bored. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like there was a for me there was a small time where the first thing was true. I heard it. Yeah, and then. But most of, yeah, again, like you, most of the time that I've heard that fact, it's been in connection with the, and the documentary crew killed them because they were bored. Exactly. And so that's, so I, I figured it would just kind of end there and it was just like, whatever. But actually, so the main misconceptions about lemmings seem, apparently there's a lot of them. I, I found that some people even think that they explode, which a yeah, quick answer to that is that they can be very aggressive during the mating season and then... And then like there's a big population and then a lot of them get killed by predators and picked over by scavengers. And so the end result is they look like they kind of burst, but that it's not actually and like no one has ever seen a lemming explode. So it's just like one of those random things that people say that has like no foundation at all. But there's a lot of misconceptions about lemmings and it seems that most of them stem from their massive fluctuations in po population density. So during low times, you can have as few as like one lemming per square mil or per million square feet of of their their habitat. That On was the very upswing, few. The same area might host a population 3,000 times larger. Which would be 3,000 levees per, per million <laughs> square feet. Right. Like, I mean, but that's a massive, and that, that percentage cycle, wise, that that's cycle happens roughly every four years. So it's like, like it builds mm. up and then cycles down in four years is, is what I could see. And it's just huh. like crazy population swings. Like people have noticed this like way back. Like some of the first theories about their population swings come from like the 1530s. This guy called Z uh, Ziegler, if I'm getting this right, Ziegler of Strasbourg suggested that they spontaneously generated out of storms in the winter and then 
<laughs> and then died <laughs> then died when the grass grew back in the spring. He was also a lawyer at Babcock <laughs> Law Firm. Yes. Um, he went on anyway, to write about the traffic so statistics. I mean, like, um, and apparently, like, in Norse folklore and things like that, like, the swarms of lemmings would sometimes be considered, like, a forerunner of, like, doom and destruction and, and all of these sorts of things. Like, just so people noticed that this was going on. You even see, like, in uh, there's a magazine called Popular Science Monthly. And in 1877, they published an article about lemming migration, which talked about because some lemmings are actually really good swimmers. And so, again, this is part of where the myth comes from is because some people will say they throw themselves off cliffs. That's the more popular one. But then some will also say they drown themselves because they will, like in these large groups, swim even small lakes. Apparently, they can swim really long distances. Huh. Um, and, of course, if it if you get a large group of them and they swim and it's a little farther than they think it is, then you could potentially have a bunch of lemmings drown. But it's not like an intentional like lemming cult where they swim out of the middle and then just drown themselves. Um, it's an accidental suicide. That's like, and I've not found any references to that actually happening. I've just found that suggested that someone could have seen that and thought that, but I've not actually found any record of it actually happening. But there is record of them being able to swim successfully quite long distances. So that's the one really charismatic lemming who's like, <laughs> "We can do this," and he's like, "Let's go." He's the really super fit lemming, and all the, of the yes. lemmings who are in his spin class <laughs> try and do the swim, and they don't. They don't quite. Make it. He's the he's the Jeff Winger of of lemmings. But anyway, so so they actually suggested that the lemmings were swimming into the Atlantic Ocean to the lost continent of Lemuria. <laughs> there is so much so to much this story. going on to this. And anyway, so so there was a, like a hypothesized missing continent in like the 1800s, and then it was proved to be false. And so like the occult picked it up. And so there's like lots of like mythical stuff surrounding it now. This, they thought they were like swimming towards this lost continent. So almost like I guess. You know how there are some creatures that have like homing instincts and they right. transfer. And so I guess they thought that the lemmings just hadn't picked up the notice that this continent was missing. And they were all still swimming there. They were all still swimming there. So having large populations during times when they have overcrowding is what gives rise to these kind of mass migrations. And they move over the landscape. And like I said, you know, even swim small lakes in search of suitable habitat. And so this kind of gave them this sort of crazed herd mentality reputation. And that was kind of like the start for it. And what I actually couldn't find is where the myth that they commit suicide comes from. The the movie, because the movie was in was made in 1958, and we'll get to that in a second. But in the early 1950s, there's like a cartoonist who drew a bunch of lemmings throwing themselves off of a cliff in Norway. Um, so it's urban myth that someone went to make a documentary about. Exactly. And the great part is they picked the wrong lemming. The lemming that is supposed to commit suicide is the Norwegian lemming. And the documentary was made in Canada with a totally different species of lemming. <laughs> And so they wanted to find this. They wanted to capture this. And so they weren't finding it. So they paid the natives a dollar per lemming to just catch live lemmings, loaded them into the back of a truck. Apparently, they herded like some towards the edge of the cliff so that they could get like footage of these lemmings looking over the edge of the cliff. And then the actual footage of the lemmings leaping out into space is literally them dumping them out of the back of a truck over a cliff. So it is actually true that the documentary crew killed the lemmings. So it is it is true that they did it. It's not true that they were bored. It was they they were intentionally trying to capture this supposedly natural phenomenon and couldn't. You you wonder if they ever found out that it was the wrong lemming and were like, "Well, maybe if we went to Norway." But I mean, we all know that the lemmings killing himself is balderdash, but apparently the idea that the the myth came from that documentary is also balderdash too. So it's kind of a yes and no. The it was popularized by that documentary. That was when right, it really took right. off, but it did exist beforehand because there's yeah. at least in 1953 We've got like a cartoon of a bunch of lemmings throwing themselves off a cliff. And then, like I said, way before that, they kind of had this crazed herd mentality reputation. reputation. Huh. They're just dumping lemmings off of cliffs for their dumb documentary that, about the wrong species of lemmings. And, and apparently, well, so it's it's not about the lemmings themselves. It's like about all sorts of wildlife. And so apparently, other than that, the documentary is a pretty good documentary. Um, at least like according the to fundamental, one source. 
the fundamental idea of a documentary or I guess any education based media where you're trying to teach someone else. This is like fundamentally against the observation of the world for the teaching of other people. Well, I guess it kind of goes though with that that adage about you when you observe something, you change it. So you're always talking to anthropology about by observing something, you have changed it. I guess this was just a more hands-on approach to that kind of a philosophy. They took it to the absolute next level. <laughs> so you said this was a Disney documentary? It was a Disney documentary. So was Walt Disney Disney, like writing the checks to dump lemmings off of cliffs. I think it was actually Mickey because he didn't want any competition for most popular rodent because they're kind of adorable. I, I really did not think that there would be this depth of information about lemmings. We had such a reverse. I thought I was going to have a pretty easy ta time because this is such a quoted statistic. Yeah. And I thought I was going to be going down like the second level of this statistic is like, well, how true is this depending on what state you live in? But then... I found nothing and you found everything. <laughs> well, that wraps up our first episode of Research Hour, or as Joshua likes to call it. Research! Thank you all very much for listening. And don't forget to check out our sponsor, Car Wash Ice Cream. Car Wash Ice Cream, where you can get your car washed and eat an ice cream at the same time. It's delicious, it's nutritious, and it's sparkly clean. <laughs> Simon Pegg and uh, who's the guy, the other, the sidekick in Hot Fuzz? I don't know. He's in a bunch of those movies, but I don't remember his name. Anyway, they're pairing up for an Amazon original where they are paranormal hunters. That it might looks be interesting. Delightful. It looks interesting, and they're like low budget, like the people who get on YouTube and go into like abandoned houses with a camcorder, like that kind of delightful. It looks interesting. I'm Silas. I'm Josh. We're going to be discussing Tolkien, the 2019 movie about the, uh, well, the life, the courage, and the fellowship of J.R.R. Tolkien. Who, by the way, is one of my all-time literary heroes. Right. So that's something we should maybe address uh, at the front is I know very little about Tolkien. And this is... It, you know, it's at least presented as semi-biographical. I don't know how much license they took with a lot of this stuff, but it is presented as we see him growing up. We see uh, things that influence, uh, influenced him and maybe the stories that he told. And I have no idea how much is real in that movie and how much is fake. So I'm sort of just going to be operating under the assumption of everything in the movie is real because that's the only thing that I have. Whereas you have a bit more knowledge of the of the life of the real Tolkien. I have I have a little bit of a knowledge. Most of my knowledge is literally like the Lord of the Rings. Um, I have them all unabridged on. Well, I used to have them on cassette tape and now I have them on CD and I've listened to the book unabridged probably 10 to 15 times each each of the books. Um, I also have The Hobbit. So I, that's that's a lot of what I know is that um, I, I think I have enough knowledge about kind of his backstory of his, of his life to kind of confirm certain things like, oh, yeah, that happened. I don't know that I know enough to be like, oh, no, that didn't happen, if okay. that makes any sense. So I'm not like a I'm not like a biographer of Tolkien. Right. But this is very much and this may be giving you too much credit. You'll have to let me know. Yes, it is. In the <laughs> in the land of the blind, the one and my the one eyed my man is king. Yeah, I have one eye and a very heavy stigmatism. <laughs> right. So you're but... <laughs> basically blind, but you've got slightly more vision than me in the realm of Tolkien. Yes. All right. So this is directed by, it's spelled Dome. I'm guessing you don't pronounce this guy's first name as, as Dome, but Dome Karowski. It's, you know, a name that I'm not familiar with. He doesn't have a terribly long uh, history for directing. I was just about to ask, what else has he directed? He's directed a and decent number of things. But anything I would have heard of. anything I had heard of. Oh, yeah. If you haven't heard of it, I almost certainly almost have not certainly. heard of it. Right. I think, uh, I think he's maybe directed a lot of stuff that didn't get like a wide American release. Ah. Uh, so. So he's French. I'm just kidding. What? <laughs> So I, I think I think he's in a 
a at least somewhat accomplished filmmaker, but not in our market. Yeah, yeah. And so didn't recognize his name. Nicholas Holt plays J.R.R. Tolkien. If you have seen Mad Max Fury Road, you will know him as Nux. You have not seen Mad Max Fury Road. I have not, but I so, have seen um <laughs> I have seen the trailer for the upcoming show, I think it's on Hulu, The Great, in which he plays uh, the crazy Russian emperor oh. that Mar- that Catherine the Great marries oh, and yeah. then essentially takes over Peter. from. Yes. Oh, he's also in The Banker, which is a movie that we almost watched. Tonight. Yeah. Well, hey, I guess he's just everywhere you turn. Well, also the one we saw the trailer for, The Favorite. He's in The Favorite, yeah. He's in The Favorite. We're here to discuss <laughs> Tolkien. Which is a movie that we both saw the trailer for. I guess it came out in 2019. So we probably saw the trailer in 2019, maybe late 2018. And we both thought, wow, that looks interesting. Like, even before the name of the movie came up, it had this, you know, some of this fantastic imagery from World War One. So the, the trailer was striking in the imagery. Yeah. And then the name Tolkien comes up and it's like, oh, it's a movie about Tolkien that is at least an area that I'm generally interested in. So I was interested in the movie, and then after that trailer, I think I heard nothing about it. I had no idea if it came to theaters in my area or anything. So it totally disappeared. And now it was something like, hey, this is a movie we're both interested in. We should check it out. Yeah, I I was pretty excited when I saw the trailer. And like I said, I don't know a huge amount of, of Tolkien's backstory, but one of the things that you definitely get a feel for when you know about his service in World War One, in a lot of the descriptions, um, especially of Mordor and just like the the land just absolutely torn up and laid waste, he's got there, there's I mean, and again, I speak as a reader, not as someone who's experienced anything near that in any way, shape or form. But there's an authentic authenticity to the way he describes even like the taste of the air of this kind of place that seems to mm. That seems to stem from that. Now, a lot of people have said that because of things like that, there were that that Tolkien was using the Lord of the Rings, especially since it was published after World War II, as kind of an allegory for World War One and World War Two, and uh. that was something he flat out denied. He detested allegory. While there were definitely things, obviously, like f- any writer that were influenced by his own experiences, things that were going on in the world around him and history in general. He, he, I don't think there was any sort of intentional borrowing from the bigger picture of the world wars that really drove the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. When you say that the imagery of Mordor and the battlefields of world war one suddenly becomes more apparent. So Tolkien is often referenced as a name in connection with Lewis and Lewis was a much more outspoken Christian. And I was expecting there to be uh, more about religion or faith or Christianity within Tolkien's life. In this movie, there was very little. And I don't know how accurate that is to his life. Yeah, again, that's one of those areas where it depends on who you ask. Because he was he was a Roman Catholic, and while I have friends who have studied his life in more detail who said his personal beliefs leaned leaned away from some of the Roman Catholic doctrines and more towards a Protestant side of things, he kind of remained very stubbornly Roman Catholic because his mother, if I'm remembering the history correctly, it's been a long time since I've heard this, but, but if I'm remembering correctly, his father was Roman Catholic, and when his mother married him she became roman catholic and her family shunned her for it Hmm. because they were protestant and Hmm. as a result tolkien became very staunchly catholic because his mother's because of his mother's family essentially refusing to have anything to do with her sort of for the wrong reasons. so yes sort of for the wrong reasons um and i love there's a story from one of his grandsons so during tolkien's lifetime the beginning of his lifetime, the mass was still said in Latin. It didn't matter where you were in the world. It was still said in Latin. That was the only official way to say it. There's this hilarious story of Tolkien, both as just kind of this stubborn guy and this guy who loved old languages. When the Pope at the time declared, hey, wherever you are, you can, you know, the, the clergy can deliver the, the mass in the language of, of the area. And everyone started going over to saying the la- the mass in English. 
Tolkien apparently would stand, you know, up with everyone else and say the the mass very loudly in the Latin, mm. uh, just because again he was that kind of traditionalist kind of a kind of a guy. And it's just this story of I don't remember which grandson, but one of his grandsons just remembering going to church with grandpa, and everyone else is saying the mass in in English, and he's very loudly <laughs> saying it in the in the Latin. So it was, hmm. he had a stubborn streak for sure. The movie starts out our opening image, if you will is that horse in the battlefield, right? Yeah. And so not 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 necessarily, not necessarily a literal horse, although there were horses used in World War 1, mm. not a literal horse, but definitely a depiction of the ring wraiths from Lord of the Rings, almost like an early version of that. Yeah. But then we very quickly go back to a time Long, long ago when he was just a young boy. Well, I think also, like, just kind of going back to that image, it's not just the the black rider that's riding across the field. He rides against a a knight, not necessarily like one of the elf lords. Um, looks more like one of the, the riders of Rohan, but but a, a knight nonetheless riding against him and, and clashes the swords. And yeah, and then it goes back to kind of the happier times. And again, you know, you have to be careful about reading too much into symbolism in a movie because you can put whatever you want, wherever you want, if you right. if you look hard enough. Um, but it, there definitely seems to be kind of a constant back and forth between light and shadow, like light and dark of, yeah. you know, some of the happy memories of life, some of the things that, you know, he loves and then the shadows of the, you know, whether they're, whether they're big things like the death of his mother, whether they're small things like um, some of the struggles he faced at school, like there, it's not necessarily all big ups and big downs, but there is kind of this constant battle between the two. And it's kind of literally what they start the movie off with. Moving sort of quickly between... World War One, the Battle of the Somme, mm-hmm. and the early nineteen somethings when he's pff, I don't know eleven or something. This would be late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds. Eighteen hundreds, yeah. So when I don't know, he was twenty twenty one ish. I don't know. Maybe nineteen. I don't know. I don't know. But like early nineteen hundreds, perhaps when he's a younger boy, and then the Battle of the Somme, World War One. Real quickly, you mentioned something there. His mother dies. That happens. I don't know. First ten minutes of the movie or something. Yeah. But how are you feeling about spoilers? Should we treat this conversation like the people have already seen the movie? Or should we do a quick recommendation so that if people want a general feeling of should they watch the movie, and then they can maybe come back for the conversation that goes into the spoilers afterwards? Okay, that's fine. Yeah, we, we should do like a quick recommendation. And okay, then... so sort of overview. It's, it's a movie about growing up, and as a... As a white male who had not the same experiences, but similar experiences in the schoolyard, separated by a hundred years to Tolkien, there were many things in the movie that felt like if you are a certain type of boy growing up, there are relationships and there are interactions that almost feel timeless. So on one hand, it's like a very specific story about Tolkien, and on the other hand, it feels like a story that any any young boy or any anyone who has grown up and lived the life of a young boy can connect with. Yeah, I I agree. It's it's definitely in a very contemplative movie. You know, like I said, there's the the themes of of light and dark. So there's up and downs. So there's definitely some moments of of a lot of lightheartedness. And I liked what you said about kind of that universal story of of growing up, obviously, and, and, and of that camaraderie that you find with close friends. One of the things I found interesting or one of the one of the reasons that that I think there's there's an appeal there, especially in a weird way for kind of things that are going on right now is I mean, I, I won't spoil anything because it's very obvious from even the trailer that I mean, from the first moment of the movie that they deal with his time in world war one and so some of these big darknesses that overshadow the movie are not it's not like they set out to have some sort of quest and the quest leads them into the darkness but rather these are people these are regular young men who have ideas who have dreams and they end up in circumstances beyond their control 
right. and they have to they have to face them whether it's the things in in the schoolyard or the things that they face on on the fields of World War 1 a lot of these are things that are outside forces that they don't have a lot of control over and that's actually a theme that you see in the Lord of the Rings like to me that's one of the the most beautiful themes in the book itself is that line from Gandalf to Frodo. Frodo says, you know, I wish I had not lived to see such times. And Gandalf says, so do I. So do all who live to see such times. But that is not for us to decide. What we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Right. And I, I don't really have any mu- anything else to say other than just if you watch the movie, watch it with that quote in the back of your head and see what you think. So it's a movie that I very much enjoyed. There'd be a, There's been a handful of movies in the last year that I have come away and almost everything in the movie worked for me. Ford vs. Ferrari, Knives Out, and this. I have I have individual problems with each each of the movies and things that I wish were a little different. But like on the whole, those were movies that I walked out of liking almost every single moment of. And yet Tolkien, I feel like I couldn't recommend to a number of people. It doesn't have a lot of action. Like, you have to be the right kind of a person to enjoy this movie. I don't know that I could give it, like, a broad recommendation. I think it's going to be a movie that really appeals to to Tolkien fans. Like, I mean, that should... I mean, that's kind of obvious. But, but to people who love the stories and want to know a little bit more about what's behind it. Uh, And then I also think that there's another audience that doesn't necessarily have to love the Lord of the Rings, doesn't even have to know the Lord of the Rings to watch it. Some of the elements might seem a little weird if you're not familiar with the Lord of the Rings. Right. But again, because of that universal kind of element of the growing up story, I think it's a little more targeted than just a general coming of age story, if you will. I don't know that it's got that across the board appeal. But I think there is an element of maybe maybe I'm trying to say if you are a writer, <laughs> if you are an artist or a creator, there may be something there for you. If you want a little bit of a slower paced movie yes, that it is. has a lot of heart and ultimately it's about close relationships, both romantic and platonic with friends and with your romantic interests. Like you don't have to have been like an 11 year old boy with an interest in fantasy novels to enjoy the movie. It helps because (laughs) a lot of the things that, that Tolkien goes through then feel very relatable. But at the same time, it's just like a lovely little story about mostly happy things that happen, but also feels grounded and relatable. Yeah. So it was a very enjoyable movie for me. And yet I know that a lot of people wouldn't enjoy it because they would walk away saying, Oh, that was so boring. Nothing happened. And it's like, Oh my gosh, so much happened. But there was a certain kind of person who would walk away from it saying nothing happened the whole time. There was just people talking and like doing things, but they weren't exciting things. Yeah, I I liked a lot of the I liked a lot of the movie. I liked um so when have we passed the introduction phase at this point? Uh pretty close, but my general recommendation is yes, maybe go see it, but like only if you're in the mood for kind of a slow burning lovely little movie about camaraderie and romance and well, no, maybe not romance so much, but like with a touch of romance and about friendship. My recommendation would be if you like movies that make you think and not necessarily in like a like a mind bending sciencey sort of way, but just kind of make you think about life, then you will almost certainly enjoy this movie. If you are really just kind of looking for more of a man, I had a long day at work and I just need to kind of veg out. This is not the movie for you. Yeah, it's slow moving, but I never found myself bored. I have a couple of beefs. Story wise, nothing major, but they they are almost certainly personal preference. But yeah, just generally, I really liked it. Yeah. And yet I recognize that many people wouldn't. So yeah. from here on out, let's go ahead and proceed. Spoilers are on the table. All right, gloves are coming off. Yeah, we can talk about anything. But I had thought maybe it might be interesting to just start off and kind of 
just from a technical side, what did we think of the movie? Like, ignore the story for a second and just think about the way they told the story visually. Like, what did we find appealing, unappealing? You know, Lovely about visuals. That. There's yes. definitely a, th- a theme we both kind of uh, referenced before now, when we were in between the end of the movie and now. There were, like, a bunch of shots with mirrors or with reflections I don't know what the director is trying to tell us meta narrative wise. Oh, but, I know exactly what he's trying to tell us. But like there was something about mirrors. It's Tolkien's work, a reflection of reality. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that's actually what he's trying to tell you. But if you notice, like some of his drawings are inspired by like the shadows. Like he when he right. first draws the Ents, it's yeah. re- it's it's inspired by the reflection, or not the reflection, the shadow of, of the, the trees. trees on his ceiling. Yeah. And then like yeah. right at the end, there's something that's highlighted by some light on his wall. Yeah. And that inspires him to write the the opening to the Hobbit. Yeah. And um um so 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 if i had to hazard a guess my um my guess is that the whole point of the movie was to look at the depth from which this great work came and that is the experience of tolkien and so if i had to hazard a guess as to why there's so many mirrors and reflections and shadows it would be that Tolkien's work came out of reality and therefore is a mirror reflection shadow of a real experience. Okay, okay so there's a... It's not just a fantasy work. It is a work which, in some way, either in a mirrored way or in a shadow-like way, it is based on reality, even if it is not lining up with reality one-to-one. Yeah. I. All right, so interesting. The movie starts off with this like dual timeline, which we're introduced with pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And then both timelines run linearly, but not at the same pace. So we start yeah. out when he's 11. Yeah, something like that. And then we skip to maybe a couple of years later. He's in like the the school and he's, you know, yeah. getting to know friends. And then we jump forward to basically well, him going off. You kind of see him at like then, junior high, and then you see him at the end of high school, and right, then, and then going off to college, yeah. and then going off to war, and so it's like we we and you get a little glimpse at the end of him coming years home. into well after after the war years into his professorship, um, and the beginning yeah. of his writing career. So once he's married and has childrens, yeah. So I guess we go like dual timeline until we resolve with him going off to war Mm -hmm. and then him coming home from war. Yeah, I guess that's right. And then it's just one timeline from there on out. That's true. But yeah, they established that. And then from the trailer of the movie, I thought a lot more of it was going to be about World War I, but we spent most of our time in 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 the past, you know, looking, growing up with him, starting as a, as a very young boy with his mother, uh, leaving town with the, what happened to his father? Did his father pass away at that? Yeah, his point? father. I, his father had had passed away previously. I don't remember the circumstances. Oh. The thing that I remember, and this has been so long that Wikipedia would probably be a better source. But the thing that I remember is that the reason they left South Africa, it's either his father died. And that's why they left South Africa or they left South Africa and his father died not long after they got back to England. It was uh, it was very soon within that timeline on, on one side or the other. And I can't remember exactly which one it is. And so. So, yeah, he, he loses his father pretty young. Yeah. So then we go to the like home for orphans, which is, I guess, a rich widow who has. Yeah, is- uh, Ascent, you can think of it almost like a foster parent. So she's not really yeah. running an orphanage. She's just got the two Tolkien boys and this other girl. At least according right. to the movie. I yeah. don't know. I don't know in real life. Right, but that's where we start to see the the writing is fairly sparse in that first part of the movie. And then the first the first line that gave me a little like smile was where he says like we hardly ever carry our spears anymore. As <laughs> as she's making some crack about like oh I don't Africa. know if they'll be cultured enough because they lived in Africa. And then he <laughs> makes that joke about like oh we don't really carry our spears on the daily. And it was just like, ah. And then the writing is just pretty delightful for the rest of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 
So I won't stray too much into the story just yet, just because, like I said, I, I do have, I, I think there's, and the more I think about it, the more I, I have a differing opinion on, on one element of the story. But from a technical side, uh, from a technical side of things, and one of the things that you and I both noticed, noted was when, when he first starts to interact with Edith, um, the girl that he falls in love with, he, the, you, you see a couple like him seeing her in a reflection right. moments, like he sees her in a reflection, you know, he kind of peeks around the corner and sees her playing the piano and then just like mm-hmm. ducks back around the corner and just listens. Right. You see like little moments like that, but the first like real interaction between the two of them is a conversation about kind of the state of their life and, and, and most importantly about Edith's kind of dreams of something else of right. just of, of a different life more and, than being an orphan and playing piano for a rich lady yeah more than more than being a live-in alexa um <laughs> which is yeah that's that's ha 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 um solid but, solid line but anyway so but they literally in and in some movies will do this and you you talked about how some movies will take a conversation and in order to just kind of keep things moving either so that the audience doesn't get bored with the conversation or so that we can also cover the fact that a lot of stuff has happened they'll take the same conversation and then just have them like you know the husband and wife um get up one morning and while they're brushing their teeth they start a conversation and then you see them commuting to work and they're like literally one word later in that same conversation and then no no it's what it's much better when it's one person delivering like an explanation of something or yeah something like, like reciting that. a history in in a way that makes that like there couldn't be conversation in between and so it's like literally three sentences and each sentence is separated by like 10 minutes of walking that you don't yeah. see it's like, what is this explanation? That's me in a deep conversation where someone says something and then I take 10 minutes to figure out how I'm going to respond. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so so there is kind of that approach that you see in movies. But this didn't feel like that at all because it was and it was a similar thing where it's literally she has a line of dialogue where she's talking about her hopes and dreams. And they literally just do a hard cut from a nighttime scene where they're kind of hiding and eating jam out of the jar and then they cut to a totally different, a, a daytime scene where they're sitting in the limbs of a tree yeah. and, again, talking. One of the things I thought that was really good about it is it felt incredibly seamless. Mm-hmm. Like, it was not a fade. It wasn't, a, like, a cool trick shot or anything like that where, you know, we we pan and now we're in a different location or something like that. It was literally a hard cut, if I'm yeah. remembering correctly. And yeah. they're just in the tree. And it's mid-word, I think. And, and It may have been. And it's just seamless, but it gives you this impression of one, even though it's a single conversation that we're seeing, this is a conversation that they have throughout a period of time. Right. The the repeated discussion of what each hopes and dreams the future might hold. Yeah. And I thought that did two things. One, it just, you know. I mean, it did kind of vary up the the location, although I don't think it really needed to because it was such a short line, too. It wasn't like it wasn't like we were doing it because, man, this is going to be boring if we don't change up the scenery. Like it's but it's building pretty that short relationship. Exactly. It builds on that relationship and it makes it feel like they've been friends for longer when this is literally the first set of lines that they've had together. Right, right. They, they exchange some some glances at dinner. And it's like obvious that, you know, there might be a little some some there. Yeah. But this is, yeah, the first time that we see them actually interact. You know, it's in secret and then it's out in a tree. And that continues for much of the movie. They kind of have a sneaky relationship. Yeah. Where they're, you know, he uses a mirror to see like when, I don't remember the name when, of like the, the lady the who the runs lady, the house. Yeah. But when the, the rich widow, perhaps, when she goes into her room and then he signals to her like, hey, let's go out. Yeah. And then they go out and, you know, they have conversations and go to dinner and whatever. Speaking of which, a little bit of a side tangent, side tangent. This is one of the things that I absolutely loved that they included was the part where they're in the tea, the 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 tea. I don't, it's not a shop. The, is it a tea house? Cafe? 
It's not a can well, you just say cafe? Yeah. They're in this very fancy cafe. Right. And or restaurant. And they have these sugar cubes and she throws one into the hat of one of the ladies. Now, the way I heard the story, I don't know if this is the film version of that or if maybe I just heard the story wrong. But the way I heard that story is there was a uh, a tea shop that they would go to and like some of the some of the seating was on like the second story, which included a balcony and they would sit there and take the sugar cubes and drop them into the hats of people walking by <laughs> until they ran out of sugar cubes and then and then would like swap out the sugar dishes with another table so that they could keep doing this. So that's the <laughs> way that I heard the story. I don't know if this is the film adaptation or if I just heard it wrong. Right. But the fact is that that is grounded in reality and I just loved the fact that they included that. So as we as we move forward in the movie Tolkien on the front lines of World War One is he's sick, he's got a fever, and then he's also trying to make it to the front lines where his friend is. And this is one of those points where it's like the World War One stuff doesn't make any sense and doesn't hold any weight until we understand the relationships that make it meaningful. So as we're building, because the World War I stuff, visually it's impactful. And it's it's horrific visuals that you're seeing, right? Like that crater full of bodies. Yeah. And then the, 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 the mud or the water at the bottom of the crater is literally red with their blood. Yeah. Like visually they're very impactful. But they mean so much more as we learn more about Tolkien and the relationships that he had that brought him to this moment. And so we have Tolkien like moving to the front line and we find out, you know, he's trying to get to his friend to find out if his friend is still alive because his friend's mother has written to him and asked him like, hey, I haven't heard from my son. Is he still alive? And so he's going off to find him, but he's fevered. And so he's accompanied with this other guy who's helping him try and get to the front line. And then at the same time, Going back in time, we have his relationship with Edith, as that's building, and then his relationship with these four friends, which he initially starts off not friends with. You know, it's it's always hard to be the new kid transferred to a school, as I'm sure you know, being a being a homeschooler. Oh, but man, it was always it's always hard. hard to be the new person in a in an established group, and oh, it's yeah. like all of these rich even school the homeschool boys. Knows that. Oh, well, I mean, it's it's true of everyone. Workplaces or, or uh, you know, well, had, like invi- uh, meetings or like conferences. Yeah. It's always hard when you don't know anyone. And yeah. so he's he is a poor orphan schoolboy at a rich kid's school. Yeah. And so he has a couple of bad interactions, like they steal his book, which is, I guess they're reading Chaucer, but he mm-hmm. has it memorized because I guess he's just been such a prolific reader even to that point in his life. Yeah. I love it. I don't know if that's based in in fact. I could like just but they based on what to I know about him and and they fail because yeah, he's got it memorized. Based on what I know about Tolkien, I could definitely see that being true, but I have no idea if that's based in fact. But yeah, it was a great moment. Um so all right, so about that going back and forth with the World War 1, I, I think that might I I'm I'm the jury's out for that on me. Uh, and oh, I loved it, and I I see why. I don't know. I felt like I felt like I kept waiting for it to pay off, and it never did. That's kind of how I felt about the whole movie. Yeah, and that's my other beef, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so the World War Two back and forth bit. World War One. World War One. Thank you flipping my wars here um so the the back and forth with world war one i don't know if this would have fixed it i liked the fact that it wasn't just linear where you know starts when he's a boy and works up to the war and through the war yeah i might have done it and this is literally just off the cuff, I think I might have preferred it if we had started with the war, gone back, and then built back up to the war instead of going back and forth. Okay. I think, and again, I don't know how much of this is based in reality, so it's hard to say. Maybe they were just working with what actual story was there. 
but with him being kind of fevered and and lethargic almost in some ways like he's got this intensity that he's got to go find his friend but mm -hmm. at the same time he's just like physically he's physically drained, drained. which very understandable yeah um but it I never caught the urgency even at the end. And that... Really? Huh. It didn't build for me. And oh. I think it was because we kept coming back to it. And in some ways, it was more of the same. And so we would hmm. make progress in the story of his life. And it felt like they were just kind of saying, kept saying, hey, guys, we're going to come back to the war. Hey, guys, we're going to come back to that war. Hey, guys, remember that war? We're going to get there. And and it never it never felt like, oh my gosh, here's another war sequence. It wasn't like it felt bad. It just I kept feeling like there was something missing. And I I don't like I said, maybe it would have worked to have to open with the war and then build back up to it. But the going back and forth it wasn't even necessarily distracting. It just felt like it kind of lost its effect after a while. Oh, I dug it pretty much the whole way through. And it's like, we know that he's looking for someone on the front line. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we meet his three schoolyard friends after they have a bit of a fight in a rugby match. And that uh, the headmaster's son is like, needlessly aggressive for some reason like just takes takes issue with him for no particular reason yeah and then they end up making up and you know they invite him to tea and then that's where they go off to that that cafe with the tea not the restaurant where they where she tosses the sugar cubes but they go off well, to actually that, it's a bookstore okay sure that bookstore with the tea shop in the back is still there and they sort of form their first friendship and then the next time, I don't remember if they said Jeffrey's name, so we actually know which one of the boys in the that he's friends with is Jeffrey's. But then at some point he says Jeffrey's when we go back to World War One, and it's like, okay, we know he's looking for one of those specific friends, and if you're paying yeah. attention to the names, then you know which one of those friends yeah. he's going to be looking for. I the intent the the switching back and forth worked for me. And I, I liked the, you know, he's, he's, I do agree that if you write it down on paper, those scenes don't have real impact on the storyline, but it's, I don't know, for me, it, w it worked almost like the slow build. And then eventually he has to give up and he's just like, he's exhausted lying on the dirt, surrounded by dead bodies with his feet in a pool of blood and telling his the guy that he's with to go on and to find Jeffries on the front line. Yeah. And then that's where we leave him for a while, like stricken with fever, almost dying on the ground, and then we go back again to another well, length of time in the yeah, past. Yeah, and we, we come back to him in that pool at least two times. Like it's Yeah, I can think of one time, but yeah, perhaps two. It's and I think that was for me kind of I don't know. I I felt like I can I can understand why it didn't really vibe with you, but at the same time, it worked for me. Yeah, I feel like if you're gonna do it, because you almost have to treat it like two different storylines, because that's really what it is. Even though they're part of the same storyline, right. I felt like there wasn't enough story. Even though it was a small storyline, I felt like there wasn't enough story. I think it was just supposed to be like, oh, once we catch that it's Jeffries, we're supposed to be worried because of the other storyline, and I don't know. It just kind of felt. Yeah. not as powerful as it could have been um, or should have been. But uh, but that that was it. And then also, kind of like you said, for me, I felt like the movie didn't fully pay off. Again, you kind of get to the end. You have this like, OK, cool feeling um, like you don't get to the end. and You're like, man, that was a boring movie or or no. oh, my gosh, I wasted my time. It's not that it's just more of a. Okay, nice. That's you know, that's that's cool. But I wondered how much of that was because you I, I wondered if I didn't know anything about Tolkien 
if I would have even gotten that little bit of satisfaction at the end. Because most of what kind of like from almost the get go, right? You're expecting the moment when he discovers Middle Earth. Right. right. That's what you're expecting. And but it's not even about that. It's yeah, it's it's not like a origin story of Myrtle, Middle Earth per se, but it is like the story of the founder of Middle Earth. And so you're right. and you see him like skirting around it. Like you see him drawing pictures of the ants and you see him starting to come up with a language and yeah. and like all of the things that are gonna lead to it. And so you see all of that. And I'm not and you know, obviously you're not expecting if you know the timeline, you're not expecting the Lord of the Rings itself because that doesn't come until after World War II. Um, even though a lot of the lore and everything was already in place bef- well beforehand, it almost felt like the tension that was built was from withholding something rather than from from giving us a sense of direction. And so it was like I'm with it was, it was almost like the story's withholding his discovery of Middle Earth and will give it to you when you get to the end. So sit still. Yeah. And and so the movie has an almost pointless feeling to it. Yes. And so it's like perhaps maybe it's like drinking water when you're not particularly thirsty. <laughs> like it's not doing much for you, but it's not bad. Yeah, no, and and again, one, there are some incredibly like you said, some some just very beautiful visuals, um, some very poignant moments. In, in so many different ways. And so it, it, I don't want to confuse it with with necessarily like a it's it's not a boring story. It's not a bad story. I just feel like it was a directionless story. I keep trying to think of like ways to make it an analogy. And it's like a, a, it's a movie with relationships, but without the typical story points that we're used to seeing in a movie. So it's very heavy on relationships. The whole movie is about relationships. Well, maybe not the whole movie, but all of the stuff that happens in the past before he goes off to war is all about relationships. It's about relationships, his relationship with Edith. Not so much his brother, interestingly. His brother is like dotted throughout the storyline, but never really a factor. But it's about his relationship with Edith. It's about his relationship with his friends. It's about growing up and having to struggle in ways that his rich friends don't and having this romantic relationship with Edith that in some ways he feels like he can't act on or he feels awkward about acting on because they are both sort of foster children in the same house. And so it's about these different stages of relationships and different stages in life and then about trying to accomplish what you dream of and what you want it doesn't have the typical like, storyline that we're used to in a movie. I feel like there are some ways that it it could have. I and I and again, that's difficult to say. And and I'm not saying that. Oh, we need to you know warp all of the things and all the events to create some sort of narrative. You know, and and to have a inspired by um, rather than based on right. kind of a story. But I think that there's a way. There, there are some some universal questions, longings, things like that. Some answers that he's looking for that he does kind of find some answers for. And maybe even some questions that don't get answered. And you can have that. And I think there's a way to kind of start that thread. I guess it to me, frustrating is the wrong word. It's just like, I guess it feels less frustrating, more like a missed opportunity. Because it feels like he's got this theme. Again, we talked about at the beginning, the light and the dark, the the good and the bad that's going on in his life. You know, you see his imagination at the beginning. And even in the the darkness that they start to go through, that he's got this imagination. His mother fosters this imagination and then his mother dies. And this is, you know, of course, a a very dark and heavy shadow over over that. And then he ends up in this foster environment. He ends up in this school. And so so kind of a continuance of this low point until he makes friends and until he meets Edith. And now we have, you know, some brightness. I guess trying to make sense of the tragedy. I got the feeling at the end that they were expecting me to have been satisfied that there's meaning from his 
all of the things that happened to him, but I didn't feel like the way they portrayed Tolkien made it feel like he had found meaning out of all of the things that he had been through. And of course, it doesn't mean he has to be a fully developed human being at that point, you know, because he's, I mean, this is what the twenties when the right. you know, twenties, early thirties, yeah. when, when this is happening and, and you know, he's, gonna live until the the 70s he's got 50 years of life ahead of him yeah we're not expecting him to be that tolkien but i think yeah. that we could have elevated a thread that was there highlighted a thread that was that was already kind of inherently in this story of ups and downs of trying to understand and i think that's an important part of the creative process in general um and one of the things i found interesting tolkien talks about in a in a letter Maybe it was a letter, maybe it was an essay, I can't remember. But he talks about how the creative process is a reflection in us of God because he's a creator. And so I think there's an element, God, as the creator, gives gives the definition, if you will, of existence through creation. And we as human beings, those of us who, who like to create whatever areas we find ourselves being creative in, it's almost like a reverse engineering, if you will, through the creative process, especially if that creative process is taken capped up to God, we can start to make sense of the world that we live in, of the ups and downs and the highs and lows. I mean, like a, a great example for me is my brother who writes music and that's how he processes his life you can tell yeah. what my brother's going through by the music that he's writing because yeah. the way he processes his life is through his music and i think that's a, a a pretty you know whatever type of art whatever type of creativity you find yourself participating in i think that's part of the way that we make sense of the world or part of the way that some people make sense of the world is is by literally, like we talked about, reflecting the world. And when we kind of reflect the world, we put it up on a projector and we can kind of look at it and go, okay, so why is why are things the way that they are? Um, and that's, again, me and my love of Lord of the Rings. You see that kind of throughout the Lord of the Rings in so many different themes. I love... Uh, Aragorn's interaction with Aomer and he's like and 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 Aomer's trying to figure out what he's got to do and Aragorn's like hey listen good and evil are not different with the elves and with the dwarves and with men good and evil are good and evil and you've got to do the right thing wherever you are whenever you are whoever you are big solid things like that all the way to things like Faramir who is the reluctant warrior I love that theme he's like I'm a warrior and I'm good at being a warrior but I'm not a warrior because I love being a warrior I'm a I'm a warrior because of the things I love to protect because I love songs and I love peace and I love families being able to grow up and these are the things that I love and so because of that I hold a sword and so mm. you see so many different characters processing so many really deep things and because it's isolated from reality by being in a fantasy world those themes kind of get highlighted in a way that they don't when they're kind of set amid the intricacies of reality. Right. Art allows us to elevate a real life experience and to look at it in a different way. Yes, you said that way more efficiently than I did. <laughs> this has taken us tremendously longer to get to this point than I would have thought. So we pretty much have to wrap this up in the next couple of minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry. And we did not get very far into the movie as far as I thought we were going to. Like a lot of the movie review podcasts and show that I enjoy, they sort of progress through the movie. And uh, we made it <laughs> partway into the movie. And then I totally derailed us and went like, big picture. Well, no, but we also started with a very long intro. That's true. So I am genuinely, I am very curious to hear my wife's perspective on this movie hmm. because I have my own thoughts. Like I really enjoyed the movie, but I also recognized that like, as I was watching it, I was kind of thinking like, there's no story here. And I mean, to some degree there is right. It is about a person who deals with problems and has things that he has to overcome. But it's also yeah. at the end of the day, it's just a movie about relationships. Well, it's a and biopic. it's about, we see those relationships developing, right? But there are many ways to do biopics and there are many ways to see relationships turn into a story yeah and this movie doesn't do it in a traditional way so i'm curious if like for example my wife to watch this and if she has if she walks away from it just thinking wow this was tremendously boring and there is something about like you have to be 
maybe a male or you have to have had similar experiences growing up that you can identify with. Or if there is something truly a little more universal about this movie that other people who maybe didn't have the same growing up experiences as you and I, who found Tolkien at a pretty young age, who fancied ourselves as writers in a similar vein. Maybe if we never actually completed a novel, we still fancied ourselves. We all and thought we, we were, had we one were able us. to have that imagination yeah. where in the shadows or in the dancing light on the wall, we see more than is there. And maybe you have to be a person with that experience to enjoy this movie. Something you said, and I don't, I don't even remember exactly what it was, but something you were just saying kind of helped me to see it. It might be better to think of it as less of a story and more of experiences. Because that's really what it is. It's not necessarily a a narrative yeah. in what we might think of as a traditional sense, but it is the experiences of an individual in a real life narrative. And so so yeah. it has a more natural approach to that. And my writer brain kind of go kind of rebels against that a little bit. I, I guess my potential meters like, man, there's so much great stuff there. I feel like more people would see the greatness if you couched it a little differently so that you didn't have to have these preconceived notions to get it. And yet at the same time, this is not some sort of aloof art house film that no. has no connection to narrative. It is not some kind of experiential garbage cinema kind of a movie where someone is not just all. faffing about and trying to convince themselves that their pile of garbage is a pile of gold. There is there is some degree of traditional story and narrative. It is just not like if you go to a screenwriting class and what they're going to tell you to do, this is not this does not hit all of those boxes. Yeah. And so I enjoyed it, but I don't know how many other people would also enjoy it. Yeah, and, and like I said, I feel like there's because it's such a, a it's it's a story with so many compelling elements that like a lot of times you find in fiction, like that forbidden love kind of element and those sorts of things. Part of me wishes that it had been given a little more structure so that more people could get more out of it because it is based in reality. But that's just kind of a, my yeah. two bits. I'm definitely split on that because I like when people do things that aren't as locked down traditionally narrative. And I can enjoy this movie for the movie that uh, the director made. But at the same time, you are right. Maybe more people would have enjoyed the story of Tolkien if it had been couched a little more traditionally. But that is going to have to wrap us up for this. Do you have a closing sentence? Similarly to Tolkien's writing in The Lord of the Rings, even though God is not directly mentioned in this, and I don't think the people behind this project were Christian, the theme of light coming out of darkness to me is an encouraging one and one that I was glad to see at really the heart of the film. And there you have it. Maybe go see Tolkien, maybe don't. I'm Silas. I'm Josh. Thank you for listening and goodbye.